All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Good morning, Peter. Uh, my name mm-hmm. is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the students in Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Peter Ulrich accepted our invitation to a show. Peter, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Peter, the last two years have been, you know, very difficult with COVID. I want to know if you were affected. and If you're a tour musician, you couldn't, you couldn't tour, you couldn't do anything, you were stuck at home. And, uh, you know, some bands that depended on, on, on touring because they're not releasing records, they, they went out of business, they went back to school, they got another job, whatever. You know, how, how COVID affected you? How are you holding up? Right. So I haven't been touring for a long, long time, sadly, because I love the live work. But um, I, for my own um, solo work, it's just not feasible financially to put a band on the road for that. And um, so most of my live performances for many years have, have tended to be just guest appearances with other with, with friends, bands and people I know. Um, so from that point of view, uh, the, the lockdown didn't, didn't affect me. Um, and in actual fact, uh, although I have to be a little bit careful with this because I don't want to, um, make it uncomfortable for people who had bad experiences during COVID, but it actually acted as a catalyst for me to do a number of things, find time for a few things that, that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. So, yeah. Um, I did. I worked on a new recording project during that time with um, a singer-songwriter friend of mine, Lisa Tenzin Dolmer, and uh, together with the uh, guy called Zach Ware, who's a guitarist with the Proclaimers, and we did a, an album during 2021. Um, but the main thing for me was that it gave me uh, the the impetus to um, to really sit down and write the memoir that has just been published. That's um, right. Good. Going yeah, back yeah. through my time with Dead Can Dance and subsequent solo career, etc., uh, which I'd written a few chapters for probably ten or twelve years ago, but then it just got shelved, and I I hadn't had time to get back to it. But with the lockdown and COVID, and and not being able to go out anywhere, and uh, being strapped to my desk and computer, it was the obvious thing to pick up again. Um, and once I got back into that, I really, I did, um, I got really inspired by uh, going back through everything and researching it all again. Um, and that became a, you know, my sort of obsessional project for much of the much of the lockdown period. So for me, uh, the the lockdown uh, had that productivity to it. Um, and health wise i did i did eventually get covid but only after i'd had two of the uh, vaccinations and i have to say that was you know that that saved me i i i had the bad cough for 10 days or whatever and yeah i mean that was a nasty cough but uh, but that's i got away with that so right. um yeah i you know i got off very lightly um so Yes, I'm. I'm one of the very fortunate ones. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I, I, um, so many people die here in the United States, like a million, and all over oh, the world. It's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, some and people the, believe the, on it. Some people don't believe in the vaccine. That's completely relevant. I just wanted to know if that affected you. For me, <laughs> as a selfish point of view, right? I, um, I, I'm a computer scientist, so I began working from home. The company say go home, work for there. Mm. And I open one radio, send the link to friend. They like it, then I open another one. And then I, as a way to listen to my own music, right? Instead of taking vinyl. Yeah. And then I, I thought, well, the, 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 the musicians are not touring at all. Uh, they are at home. They cannot tour, so they might be bored. So I want to start calling people. And uh, and uh, it was hard at the beginning, right? Nobody mm. was getting back to me. And... Uh, and uh, Eventually, Steve Hackett from Genesis gave me a break. I talked to him. We say, "Yeah, let's do it." Right. Yeah. And yeah. then now, two hundred fifty or whatever done. I have done. I'm very okay. shy, so this is. I <laughs> sort of came out of the shell or something that okay. uh, I'm getting more comfortable. And you, like anything else, you you learn by doing, right? You know, you review yes, and you take the what type of question to ask. Mm. Uh, you need to review the 
biography, discography of the artists also, also have been. But I, it, you know, it is it is a bit difficult because there are, you know, obviously you've had positive things come out of the lockdown period, and so have I. But yeah. uh, the but the the health workers who who were under such extreme pressure throughout yeah. that period, I think um we all owe such a huge debt to to oh, all those uh, absolutely those man. lives just were unimaginable during that time what they expose themselves to uh in order to care for people and the hours that they were working etc it's just incredible and uh yeah we are, we are very lucky I hope, we, I hope we never forget what they what they did no absolutely absolutely no here you know the deal on Saturday mornings and where receive a award and different hospitals give them monetary compensation because mm. they were on the front line you know it's very you and i were at home right Drinking yeah. coffee and doing, you were writing, I was writing yeah. computer code, but they no, were. That's what I mean. mm. Yeah, it's very tough. Let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a, in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking piano lessons or guitar lessons way before the drums? Okay, so there, there were, uh, it was a musical family to, to an extent, um, but my, my parents were not musicians themselves. Neither, neither of them played. Um, they loved music and they listened to quite a lot of music. But um, my father's sister, an uh, aunt of mine, who I'm still very close to now, she, she was a professional singer. And as a child, I used to get taken to um, shows in the West End of London to see her, her performing, which used to wow me completely. And I, I absolutely loved that and getting taken backstage afterwards to meet some of the members of the cast and that. Wow. So that, that was an exposure that I had at, uh, you know, when I was sort of five, six, seven, whatever. Um, and on my mother's side of the family also, there were, um, <clears throat> there were a lot of there were pianists and people who who played uh, one or two professionals um so there was there was music around but it wasn't um it wasn't something that was really uh to the forefront in in my life growing up so uh, but it was something that my both my parents came from families where they tended to uh, all the kids learned to play the or have a go at playing the piano when they were um sort of seven eight nine whatever um so yeah so i got sent off to piano lessons and um i frankly i really didn't take to it at all i, I struggled with it it wasn't i wasn't particularly inspired by what i was being asked to play um and i certainly wasn't a natural at it but um but it did give me the concept of scales and notes on a stave and a little bit of the basics of reading music i mean i've never been a i still can't to this day sit down and you know play reading uh -huh. sheet music but it gave me the concept of of it which has proved very useful in um <clears throat> in every in in a lot of the things i've i've done since so it was a good it was a good grounding but it isn't really where i where i learned and got inspired in music that's great. I, I, like I mentioned before, I, I don't play an instrument. I don't know how to read music, but I've been listening to music for the last, I don't know, 40 something years, three hours a day, you know, and, uh, but I have a wide range of stuff. Man. Just music I don't like, of course, but, uh, but there's a lot of great bands out there. And then eventually I think your family member went to Acapulco, Mexico and they brought exactly, back. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, that's just yeah, so this was the point that I, I got really inspired. My um, my grandparents on my mother's side, they after they retired, um, they'd worked really hard all their all their lives with a, a little retail business that they um, started themselves and uh, just worked twenty four seven on for for decades. Um, but when they retired, they were able to sell out the business and had a little pot of money. So they took it upon themselves to start going off on these uh, uh, sort of an annual um, cruise for two or three months at a time in different parts of the world. And uh, they had a wonderful time and went on some of the greatest cruise liners of the 60s and, um, <clears throat> you know, had, a, had an amazing, amazing time. And they would always bring back a, a small gift each for the for their for the for each of the grandchildren when they <clears throat> when they went away so this particular trip they'd been 
uh, cruising up uh, the Pacific coast of, of South America and uh, uh, came to a stop at uh, Acapulco in Mexico um, and found these uh, bongo drums, pairs of uh, small, um, you know, clay pot, animal skin, very basic uh, <clears throat> bongo drums. Um, and so they bought a pair each for me and my two male cousins um, and brought them back. So this was 1968, I think it was. And so I, <clears throat> I was presented with this scenario where my grandparents suddenly appeared walking down the front drive of our, our house with this pair of bongo drums, which were like something from, I mean, you, you, you see them everywhere now, but they, uh, but in 1968, it was really like something from another planet. I'd never seen anything like it never <laughs> heard smelt anything like it it was they were incredible and uh and that really yeah i i thought i have to learn to play these things this is this is great um and that, that's what kind of started me off that's good What's so that, that, also, that also happened just at the time that that uh i was really uh, you know we we we'd got a television our first television only a year or two before that so I was starting to see music programs that were not the same things that my parents listened to on the radio, but things where, you know, with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the, uh, the American band, the Monkees and this wow. kind of thing on TV, which really started to, uh, you know, excite me and hearing things that, you know, made me want to think I'd like to do that as well. Um so yeah, so they did. Those things sort of coincided, and and that's where I became really excited by music, and and, and it's never stopped since. Good for you. And then when you were the equivalent of high school here in the United States, like fifteen, mm. sixteen year old, were you part of any bands? Or? No, the. <clears throat> um, I had I, by that stage I'd I'd, managed, I'd got a drum kit in my bedroom and being the, uh, the 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 early seventies it was a big kit it had two bass drums and all the rack of toms going round cymbals everywhere so I could uh, drive the neighbours absolutely round the bend but um, I was I still wasn't I, I I was playing and I was you know getting developing some techniques and so on but I still wasn't really that that confident and. Uh, and also a drum kit's a damn difficult thing to transport anywhere. So especially a drum kit that big. So um, I was a bit slow on the uptake and where I did get to hear about a couple of local bands forming, there was always somebody else who sort of nipped in and became the drummer before I managed to do anything about it. Um, so I tended to go and see local bands, help um, them set up and do their own gigs, but I was in the audience rather than up on stage. Um, and then finally, when I was probably, I don't know, about 17 or 18, I did get together with a couple of friends and we, we formed a, a first band, but <clears throat> I think we had two or three rehearsals in a, in a studio, just doing cover versions of songs. And, and then it just kind of disintegrated because nobody, was very interested and it didn't seem to be going anywhere so that was it and then i went off to college after that without re really any still loving music and listening to to loads of stuff but not really playing um and at that point in my my life i <clears throat> i was really more interested in journalism and and writing um and that's where i thought i, I was going i wasn't looking at pursuing a music career at all um so I got you. And then I think uh, that's when you began uh, playing with the, the, the blues soul band Mischief. Yeah, even that came later on. So I'd gone right through college. Um, yeah. We again, there was one attempt during college. A friend of mine decided to that we should start a band and we, we got a load of people together and we had one rehearsal. It was an absolute disaster. It was a complete mess of of noise and feedback and, uh, yeah. and we probably gave up again. Um, and then, yeah, I left college, got my first job and, uh, it was just by chance. I saw, a an advert in a, in a news agent's window for a local band that was looking for a, for a drummer. Um, 
and uh, so I I got in touch with them and uh, and yep they <clears throat> they took me on. They didn't have any any other options, so they they gave <laughs> me the drum stool. And uh, yeah, that was that was a great experience. We they they were good guys, and we rehearsed twice a week. And uh, and yeah, we we fairly rapidly became pretty tight. And then we started playing the pub and club circuit, and we were just playing for beer money and for for the fun of it. And it was uh, you, so it was no pressure. Um, yeah. And it was all we we weren't writing material. It was all cover versions, uh, soul, a little bit of reggae stuff, some blues stuff um but it was yeah we had we had great fun doing that um and really if it hadn't been for that when i had the chance encounter with brendan and lisa um i wouldn't have been anywhere near ready to take up that opportunity so mm. it was a it was a you know great thing for me that i i had that opportunity to play with that band absolutely man all right let's go we'll go back and forth a little bit between your career the book and yeah so the, before the covid you you mentioned that you have kind of the the first two chapters done or so and you got busy with your life you didn't have the time and then yeah. during the covid you said well i have this this project maybe i i have time now i'm at home right maybe i should mm. ter- continue yeah, writing yeah. the book right mm. And then how you I think it was probably about four chapters, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah. And um I showed it to Brendan and Lisa at the time, and they thought it they, they thought it had something and uh worth pursuing. And uh, a couple of friends and family members read it and thought it was good. Um some people gave me a few comments on it, which was helpful to <clears throat> um tighten it up and Uh, you know some of it I'd, I'd put too much waffly stuff in which wasn't really relevant and but people were good and you know were honest with me and blunt with me and told me you know that bit doesn't work and so on so um yeah I had I had that but then it just got set aside and I got involved in in other things and time just drifted past and uh so there was probably for all that time in in between i did nothing i never even looked at it didn't do anything with it at all um and then yeah it was really the 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 covid lockdown thing that made me think this is the moment where i need to go and get that out and start really look doing this seriously um and so that was it yeah i got you, I got you. And then it happened then it flowed very quickly after that once i started once i really settled down to it and i could make three or f- <clears throat> three or four hours a day to um to really work at it and i mean some some days that would just be purely scouring the internet for um to try and find bits of information about particular shows that we'd done or or things that happened at various times and other times it would be actively writing solidly for the for three or four hours at a time but Uh, either way, it was really enjoyable to do, and it, it, you know, then it started to motor along and came together. That's a beautiful. Feel free to elaborate on uh, the. You were at home, and then the phone rang, and then the person introduced himself as mm. Brendan Perry, and he asked you to. Uh, yeah, so it was. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was just a an amazing. Um, uh, coincidence of of timing that. I I had this job which which I loved where I was working I was a press and publicity officer for a London, small London fringe theatre called Riverside Studios. Yep. It used to put on an amazing um range of uh theatre, music, art, um all sorts and it was a it was a great place to work. It was really vibrant, really buzzing, but because the uh the artistic director who was running the place at the time just uh, had no concept of uh, of trying to be frugal with the finances he he just wanted to put on the most elaborate crazy shows that he he could so he was bringing in theater companies from brazil and from poland and uh, italy and whatever and the, the the cost of these things was phenomenal and uh, so in the end the, the the place got into financial difficulty and um we couldn't stave it off and we all got issued with our redundancy notices and i'd literally 
<clears throat> just been received my redundancy notice and told that my job was ending. Um, when I, I present it in the book as as being sort of within hours of this that I received this phone call from Brendan. I, if, if I'm perfectly honest, I I can't remember if it was genuinely that quick or if it was in the next day or two, but it was nevertheless, it was virtually at the same moment. He phoned me completely out of the blue. I'd never heard of him, never met him before. And just said to me, you know, somebody's given me your number. I get it. I understand you're a drummer. We're looking for a drummer. And, uh, and, right. and asked me if I had, if I was doing anything. So I said, well, as of this moment, no, um so wow. let's go and have an audition and that's that's how it happened oh my god man that's uh that's destiny i think man huh yeah it is because um brendan and lisa had arrived in london from australia but they're <clears throat> so they they'd already they'd formed dead can dance uh a year a year and a half or so earlier in australia yep. and they've been playing the uh the club scene in melbourne um but when they came to London, uh, initially just the two of them came. Then they managed to convince their bassist, Paul Erickson, to also come over. But their, their original drummer, a um, guy called Simon Munro, or, who used to play under the name Des Hefner, he <coughs> decided that he didn't want to make the move. So they, they were there in London looking for their record deal and wanting to start doing some live shows. <coughs> So needed to find a new drummer, and um, and then how how did it go? Me. Obviously, the audition <clears throat> went well, but because you got the job, but um, well, it didn't. It didn't. It was uh, yeah. First of all, I <clears throat> because because of the type of music that I've been playing before, where you're basically just timekeeping. You know, you just sit and play the the basic four fours and and so on. Um, what Brendan was looking for in a drummer was very different to what I'd, I'd ever played before. It, it kind of had some uh, refer reference points in things I'd been listening to, um, but nothing nothing that I'd ever played before. So when when he and Paul first started playing in the in my audition, I was just sitting there thinking, well, this sounds amazing, but I, I've no idea what to what to play to it. Um, but Brendan has, I mean, Brendan himself is a is a multi instrumentalist. He's he's a very talented musician on all sorts of instruments, and he's also a very good percussionist. Yeah. Um, he'd never actually learned to play a sit down drum kit, but he kind of had an ability to come and sit at the kit, and he knew in his head what he wanted the drum beat to be, what he wanted the pattern to be. Yeah. And he could kind of throw himself into it and just hold it for about three or four bars, and then he'd lose it because he didn't have the technical accomplishment to keep it going. Yeah. So I had to kind of watch and see what he was doing and very quickly register it in my brain and then try and reproduce that. So... Mm. Uh, <clears throat> That that was the that that was right at the very beginning. I mean, obviously, once we once uh, I was accepted into the band and started uh, rehearsing with them on a regular basis, then I I kind of got into the flow of it and started to get into the mind process. So I was thinking in the same way that he in the way that he wanted me to see things and approach things, and then it gradually uh, became uh, more natural. But yeah, in the in our first audition and the first couple of rehearsals, it was uh, <clears throat> we were approaching it in that with that method, and uh, it was it was not easy. And I I really uh, initially didn't think that he he would uh, he would want me to continue. I thought it would just be too much effort for <clears throat> for him, and he'd probably go and try and find another another drummer who was a bit more accomplished in the kind of drumming that he was looking for. But um, but thankfully we we just got on really well as friends and uh, and he could see that I, I I was really inspired by what they were doing and really motivated to to get into it. So uh, thankfully for me, he decided to bear with me and uh, and train me up. Yeah, that's the great. The, yeah, they, they can dance music well before the kind of you can see in the first record, but some year later, but. 
it was very unconventional, very weird, right? It wasn't yeah. the standard, it wasn't pop, it wasn't rock, it was more ethnic and using different instruments. And, and then, you know, some people, musicians say, no, 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 I don't want to go that path. I want to, I want to make money. I want to go the, the conventional route stuff that we can play in the radio, tour, make some money, right? Hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, there was never any talk of, uh, of trying to do anything to make money or to be commercial. Uh, it was always what really inspired us in the, in the music um, and to make something really original, um, cool. but something that really, really moved us. And uh <clears throat> It wasn't that we didn't care about money and didn't, I mean, at that time we, we had, you know, just a few pence to share between us and we were really struggling to, to put food on the table. So yeah. it wasn't like we didn't want money, but we, but we were never prepared to do anything deliberately just to, to be commercial. They always, I think Brendan and Lisa in particular were always convinced that, they could make <clears throat> make music that and gather an audience that would be that would bring them the success that they they eventually did did achieve. They were always yeah. convinced that yeah. that people would warm to that music if they could if they could reach an audience. So that's why they wanted the record deal. They wanted to be able to play the bigger venues. Um, they were convinced that there was an audience for the music they wanted to make, rather than making trying to make music for an audience already existed. Yeah. It is, it is very, it, it's, it's unbelievable that they have the conviction, right? When after they, they leave their own country in Australia and mm. came to London and well, we, there's no audience for the kind of stuff, but this is what we want to do. If we get, become good, people will attend our shows and we will make it. But uh, some bands, See the commercial side of things, and they give up because because you need to pay the bill, the bills, right? You need to pay the flat, the rents, right? You need to eat, right? You know, uh, you they were very poor, so you can get a job, forget about music, or get a part time job and part time music, yeah, and so forth. But no, that, that was that was never an option. It was never dis. I mean, I I had I did some. Uh, work alongside um always did some other work alongside uh, the the band but brendan and lisa themselves were always totally 100 percent focused and and just completely believed that that's what they were put on this planet to do wow and the their success would come because they 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 just had a hundred percent belief in in the music that they were making and uh and i got pulled along with that that belief i mean i i was convinced as well that what they were were making really? was was fantastic i loved it but my tastes have always been a little bit uh off the wall never really that that mainstream so i wasn't sure that uh <clears throat> in the early stages that there were enough people around who would who would agree but uh but yeah fortunately the audiences did come and and have just stayed and grown over the years ever since absolutely so, man and I was reading the books that I, I wasn't aware, but I think in, in, in Melbourne in 1981, they did about 10 shows or so. In 82, they did another 10 shows before they arrived yeah. into mm. the UK. And I wonder why they ended up leaving. I mean, what was the need of, if that what kind of was, I don't know if I want to call it ethnic music or so at the beginning, it would have been more receptive in Australia for the type of country that is versus in Europe. Yes, I, wonder, I wonder why. Uh, the, as I say, there, there, there was really a, that, to that extent, it was a commercial decision because they, yeah. they just couldn't, there weren't the record labels. Oh, and also it. Australia is a, is a relatively small market. I mean, it's the, the right. population of Australia has been growing quite steadily in, in, in the last few decades, but, uh, um, at that time, I, you know, still a relatively small, I mean, for such a huge, vast geographical area, it's, it's oh. a relatively small population. 
Um, so it just wasn't a, it, it's just wasn't a big enough market. Um, and nearly every band from Australia that, that made it had to do that through a, through a record label and an outlet, either in the UK or in the States. Um, so you had the option to go to one or the other. Um, and only <clears throat> maybe six to 12 months before um, Brendan and Lisa decided to make the move, they'd seen Nick Cave and the birthday party move over to London and get the get their record deal with 4AD, which had launched them from the... Essentially, Nick Cave and the birthday party were, were around the same scene in Melbourne uh, that yeah. uh, Brendan and Lisa were on. Um, and they saw that work for them. And Brendan has family roots in London. Um, and at the time, his mother and father, who were still in New Zealand, where they'd originally emigrated to, were deciding to go, go back to London. So it gave <coughs> Brendan a, a base that he could go to when he arrived in London. Um, and he knew London. I mean, he grew up in London until he was 15. So he knew, knew oh, London. I see. Yeah, I see. Um, so it was really, a, you know, sort of a, a no-brainer that, that that's where he would want to go. So then he had to convince Lisa and she agreed. Um, so they came to London and uh, and it was probably at that time also for uh, the type of music they were doing. It was more likely that they would get some interest from labels in the UK such as 4AD or Factory or uh, yeah. Mute, those kind of labels were more likely to be the ones who would perhaps take an interest of music that was being made in that way. And we also had the, does the John Peel show, do you know about the John Peel show? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so okay, so, in, so we had this radio show, the John Peel show in the UK, which was giving an outlet to uh, a lot of this kind of music which didn't fit into you know the schedules of daytime radio um so it in that in that to that degree it was a it was a kind of healthy scene to to try and come into and see if you could um and see if you could <clears throat> make an impact and and get an audience in in that area and then um and then at the beginning right they well they wanted to get a record deal but in order to get a record deal right i think they end up using your you were the drummer but you were like a like uh the person with all the admin skills and uh, strategy and then you they end up yeah so yeah, I'd... recording right the demos the, the yeah. tape at the time and then you was your job to hey take a look at the phone book right the top 20 record in, in the uk yeah. and then send a copy to each one of them or something right no, it was, I mean, it, at that time, uh, out of where they were living, they, they didn't have a phone. So one one really practical thing was that I had a, sorry, I've got sun pouring through the window here. I'm yeah. just going to move this around. Yeah, sure. um, yeah I, they didn't have a, they didn't even have a telephone in the, in the flat. And obviously this was long before the days of mobile phones and internet and so on. So, um <clears throat> So j just from the practical point of view, I, I ended up being the one who was uh, who was getting on the phone to record companies and promoters and people and trying to organize things. Um, and then also I'd had the experience of, you know, I'd been a press and publicity officer uh, in my couple of jobs before I met them. So I was used to doing that kind of work. So, um, you know, I mean, I knew the format for issuing press releases and doing wow. that kind of thing so uh so yeah i just sort of kind of slipped into the role of doing that for the for the band what i'd been doing before as a as a professional job um so so that uh that also became a you know very a, a useful um facet for them to to uh to have that added into the armory of the people that were involved um and although <clears throat> It was interesting. I just because um, before I'd met Brendan and Lisa, they, they'd they'd made a like a little demo cassette, and they'd gone round themselves on just got on push bikes and gone round 
a few of the uh, independent record labels in London and just sort of walked in and handed in these these demo tapes. And nothing had come of that. So when they met me, we remade some, or not remade, we made some new, a new set of demo tapes. And I actually sent them out in the, in the post to the, to the, to the various labels, the same labels, but with a, with a press release and making it just look a bit more um, kind of professionally done. Wow. Yeah. And it was as a result of that, that Ivo uh, Watts Russell of 4AD yep. contacted us after he'd received that, that package. But then when he read the book recently, he told me that, um, that he remembered Brendan and Elisa actually coming to their offices on the bikes and handing him a tape. But obviously he didn't respond to that point. He only responded later when we sent the second tape. So it must have, it was probably the combination of the, the two things that actually grabbed his interest and eventually got him to, to get back to us. And that's, um, by, by the chance, do you, you, you have any copy of the, of the tape or they are long gone, it's impossible. Yeah, I, he, he somewhere, some someone in a factory somewhere in a basement, Matt, they may have uh, that that tape. I, I don't know, or mm. a second generation, a third generation. I I certainly haven't got a copy of it. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether Brendan has or whether they any of those, it. whether even somewhere in the vaults at Four AD that still exists, but. Uh, um, I know what tracks were on it, and I've still got a copy of the press release that I issued somewhere. But, really? Um, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Man. But I haven't, uh, yeah, I haven't got a copy of the of the tape. And then, um, so out of the, so you send the the tapes and the cassette at the time with a nice mm. press release and a good package, and then it was Ivo and Four AD, the 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 only one that get back to you or there were a couple of them and or yeah so initially Ivo got in touch with us and uh he said um you know I like I like the tape um but I just can't offer you anything at the moment because I'm uh, you know he had uh, he had the Cocteau twins at the time he still yeah. had the the, the the just the back end of Bauhaus um <clears throat> and it and um Wolfgang Press, um, Colorbox. He had a number of artists on the label. x Deutschland was still with them then. Um, and he he just didn't have the capacity to to sign anything else at, the, at that moment. Um, so he said, he just said to us, you know, leave it with me and I'll, I'll come back to you. So we thought, oh, okay, you know, that, <clears throat> who knows how long that might take. So we were still continuing to um, to rehearse, to write material, looking at trying to get a few gigs and put ourselves out to other people. And then a few weeks later, he got in, got in touch with us again and said, look, um, if I uh, put you in a support act to a couple of shows that we've got coming up, are you, you know, will you do that? And it'll give me a chance to have a look at you. So we jumped to that. And so he put us into... Uh, the support slot on two XML Deutschland uh, gigs in in London, um, and <clears throat> when we did the the first one of those at a in, at a play a venue called the Ace in Brixton, um, so that would have been, I think, <clears throat> uh, March or April, nineteen eighty three. Eighty three, yeah, yeah, he. Um, yeah, he, he was he was blown away by it. He he said to us afterwards that um, it was really just Lisa's voice on the tape that we'd sent him that that got him interested. But then actually seeing uh, um, and hearing, particularly uh, you know what Brendan was doing with guitar and vocals at the time, and and just generally seeing the way we moved the the. the what we created on stage and and how we moved around and uh, changed the instruments and the the whole dynamic of it, he he was really uh, really taken with. Um, so we did that that show and then this uh, another one a couple of weeks later with XML, and uh, and then he he came back to us. 
we uh, he came over to dinner with us and we put on a our best uh, best dinner to entertain him and uh, and his partner of the time debbie who was running the lab 4ad label with him and um as a result of that they they came back to us and said uh yeah you know we'd we'd like to work with you and um we'll give you two weeks in the studio to make your first album wow yeah yeah you knew i i think you mentioned in the book that um brenda was very meticulous and analytical in in his study of music and composition but you knew at the time that the level of i don't know of course i never seen the tape i have you know i have all the that contains records, obviously, yeah, vinyl, yeah. CD, but you knew at the time was, would have been easy or difficult to conceive the the level of Lisa in her singing skills and, or, yeah, it, when I you think... were in the studio, right, you did, when you were rehearsing, right, it's very soft, you know, you don't sing the same way as you were on stage, and, and eventually, I think you mentioned, well, we, we did the first, in the first tour, the first show, and mm. then you realize, man, she's, she's unbelievable, right? No, it's, uh, it, it is very hard to capture that on, uh, on recordings, even really high quality recordings. You, yeah. you, you, you can never quite get that, um, yeah. that incredible uh, intensity and that extra dimension that you, that you get from a live performance. So mm. I say in my, <clears throat> you know, in, in the book that, uh, when we did that, when I did that first gig with them in, in Brixton, that Ivo had put us onto the, the bill with Exmo Deutschland. Um, I mean, obviously by that point I'd heard Lisa sing many times in, um, in rehearsal. So I knew she had an amazing voice, but when she <clears throat> first started singing on stage, I, you know, I mean, I was, I'm sitting at the back of the, the, the stage playing drums and yeah. I just thought, wow, that was, you know, I was completely knocked, knocked out by, by what was coming out from her and how it was filling the, the auditorium. I mean, up to that point, I'd only heard her sing in this little um, ramshackle community hall that we used to rehearse in. Yeah. And it was obviously she had a great voice, but uh yeah, but what, but when she started singing and then it it filled that auditorium. Um, and I'd also, I, I say in the book, I remember because what used to happen in those <clears throat> at that time was probably probably still does today. There, if you're the like, we weren't even the second support band. We were the we were third band on the on the bill. So at that point in the evening, you know, you're coming on at, at sort of seven o'clock or something. And frankly, half the audience are still in the local pubs down the road, and the the ones that are in the venue are just in the bar at the back. Um, so you're playing to, uh, you know, probably twenty or thirty people who are actually bothering with the with the first support band. Yeah. Uh, when Lisa started singing, and the, and this voice kind of filled the 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 was up to the rafters in this place suddenly all the doors at the back of the hall started opening and all these people were pouring in from the bar at the back because they, they could all they could hear this this voice coming through and uh and it was obvious that they were thinking what is that we've got to go and find out what this this incredible sound is um and I, yeah that's a that's a memory that really sticks in my mind from all that time ago Right, unbelievable. And then I will give you the so the first break. You say, mm -hmm. okay, you have the studio for two weeks to, you know, put something together. How how yeah. how did it go with that? It was difficult, hard to do it. <clears throat> yeah, it was. It was. Um, um, I mean, I had a couple of little issues my myself because I'd never been in a recording studio before, and uh, and it was a bit bit daunting and uh, and and so on, but. Uh, Again, Brendan helped me help me through. There's a story about that in the in the book, but um, yeah, if, I mean, ultimately we we got all the all the parts recorded um, satisfactorily in in the first few days, but then it was the it was the production side of thing things that uh, that really caused us uh, the the problems because even Brendan didn't have any experience at that at that stage of of that that side of things. And um, yeah, he we it was it was incredibly frustrating because we were 
we were getting thing we were getting mixes that sounded fantastic on the on the monitors in the studio but when we when the engineer gave us a tape to take away and play on our you know little systems in at home and that it just sounded terrible it sounded all muddy and uh, and we couldn't work out what was 